We'll go right into the word of the Lord. Um, I'm not going to start with a title uh, verse today, a key verse. I'm going to speak today, though, on the subject, the heart of a mother. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read of a man that has two wives. Uh, why someone would ever want to do this to themselves, I do not know, but this was definitely before God um, instituted the laws of, you know, single husband and wife marriages. But this man had two wives, one Hannah and the other Penina. And the Bible doesn't give us an exact number, but it tells us that Penina had sons and daughters, had children, but Hannah was barren. Now, there was a great rivalry between these two wives for two reasons, and one was that Hannah was barren, and the other reason for this rivalry was that Elkanah, the husband, he loved Hannah greater than he loved Penina. Um, <clears throat> this caused Hannah such grief, uh, this rivalry, and also having the lack of children in her life caused such grief in her life. and. But this rivalry between these two wives came to a peak every year at the time of the yearly sacrifice. Uh, the Bible tells us that Elkanah would give two portions of meat to Penina and her children because there was more people there. Um, I believe that would have been meat for the sacrifice. But Hannah, he would give a double portion of meat also because he loved her. But Penina would ridicule and provoke Hannah to the point that Hannah would become so upset that she would lose her appetite, she couldn't eat anymore, and she would just do nothing but cry, and she was just very upset in a time that should have been celebratory, um, but instead she was upset instead of being, instead of celebrating. But Elkanah loved his wife, he loved Hannah, and it pained him to see his beloved wife in this state. He didn't want to see her um, upset and not eating and he so he in first Samuel chapter 1 verse 8 it says and Elkanah would say to her Hannah why are you weeping why don't you eat why are you downhearted he's saying just cheer up this you're okay I love you and he says don't I mean more to you than 10 sons so he's saying that yes I understand that you're barren and it's a in those days, it would have been considered a curse to be barren, but Elkanah loved her in spite of that. And he is saying, shouldn't my love replace this within you, this desire for these children? Shouldn't my love and my affection for you be more than ten sons? The truth was that Hannah did love her husband dearly, and he loved her, and that relationship was strong. They, had, they loved each other, but the heart of a mother was within her. And that heart was yearning. Even her husband's deepest affection could not satisfy the yearning of, of the mother's heart that was within her. You can also see this played out in the lives of Jacob and Rachel and Leah. If you remember, Jacob had went to um, his mother's hometown to look for a wife because that's where he was told to go to, to get his wife. And he finds this beautiful lady, Rachel, that he loves dearly, and she just grabs his attention right away. So he strikes a deal with Rachel's father to work seven years for the hand of Rachel in marriage. Well, when the marriage ceremony comes about, uh, Jacob instead was given Leah under the cover of darkness. And the next morning he realizes that he's been duped, he's been had, and Jacob goes to the father Laban and says, why did you do this to me? I worked seven years for the hand of Rachel in marriage, but you gave me Leah. And the father's like, well, sorry, but it's just customary that the older daughter has to get married first, so I had to give her to you. And they strike a deal that he would marry Rachel as well right away, but then work another seven years. So he worked 14 years for the hand of Rachel in marriage. But the Bible also tells us that Leah started having children, but Rachel was barren. In Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 and 2, it says, When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, Give me children or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her, of course, and said, Am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? 
So he's saying, is it me? Am I the one holding children back from you? No. But if you fast forward a little bit to Genesis chapter 30, verse 22 and 23, it says, Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. So you see in both Rachel and Hannah, the heart of the mother was the first and foremost desire within them to have children born to them. They, this heart of the mother was burning within them that, yes, my husband loves me. Yes, we have this relationship, but I can't feel satisfied not having children born. But after the child or the children is born, that is not when the heart of the mother is fully fulfilled, but now the heart of the mother takes on another role. It's first off, the heart of the mother is the desire to have children, but secondly is the care and the nurture of those children. Once the child is born, then the mother starts the motherly instincts of setting the room up for the child and all those things. They call it the nesting instinct that mothers go through where they'll set the crib up and they'll just in a flurry of activity they'll paint the, ba the nursery and all this stuff that they do to prepare because this beautiful child is going to come and they want to be able to nurture and care for this child so once the child is born that satisfies the desire to have the children but then the mother's heart kicks in to care for and nurture this child and they will nurse this baby through all the uncomforts of nursing, they'll nurse this baby until it's weaned and they'll make sure they feed it right and change it right. And I mean, I've changed baby diapers, you've changed baby diapers. It's not fun, but a mother gladly does all these things because she's raising this baby and she loves this child so dearly that it doesn't matter what this child does. If they throw up in mama's face and all, all over mama, all the stuff that happens with babies, you, you know, many of you have been through it all or at least seen it all happen. That doesn't matter. They don't get upset with the child. They don't get mad at the child because they love that child so dearly. Now, if I was walking through Walmart and just walked up to a random lady and threw up on her shoulder, I would find myself in a lot of trouble. She would not be happy with me. But you take her child, her baby that she's burping and it throws up on her shoulder, whatever. She cleans it up. Oh, it's okay. And because she loves that baby and is caring for it and nurturing it. There was a story in the Bible of two mothers. They both had babies. They both lived in the same house. And within a few days of the babies being born, one baby in the middle of the night dies because the mother rolled over on top of it. And But this mother wakes up and realizes what happened and takes her dead baby and swaps it for the other baby that's alive and puts it in the place of the other one right next to the mother. And takes the living baby by her in the middle of the night. Well, of course, the next morning, the real mother of the living child looks at this dead child and says, this isn't mine, this is not my baby, because the mother knew that this wasn't her child. And so they start to fight back and forth. This isn't my, ba my baby, you're holding my baby that's alive, and this dead one is yours. The real mother of the alive baby can tell, that's my baby. But these two ladies, eventually, they come to Solomon, King Solomon to settle this dispute because they were not getting any headway they couldn't you know no resolution was coming of it so in 1st Kings chapter 3 verse 20 starting at 22 it says the other woman said no the living one is mine and the dead one is yours but the first one insisted no the dead one is yours and the living one is mine and so they argued before the king. And I could just imagine that this argument could go on and on and on for hours without any resolution. But then King Solomon says, this one says that my son is alive and your son is dead, while this one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. So then the king, which King Solomon, God had given him wisdom beyond measure, and he's known as the wisest man in the world at the time. So the king, Solomon, says, bring me a sword. This wise king asks for a sword, so they bring a sword for the king. Then he gives an order, cut the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my lord, give her the living baby and don't kill him. But the other woman says, 
neither I nor you shall have the baby. Cut him in half. So she was willing to let this child be cut in half. Then the king gave his ruling, Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him, for she is his mother. This mother's heart that was within the mother of the living baby was so strong that she said, If I can't, if this baby has to die, then don't kill him. Just give him to the other, the other lady so that he can still live. This mother's heart within her was yearning, saying, no, he cannot be killed. And that is how Solomon knew which baby was belonged to who. It's because the true mother of that child had such a care and nurture for that child that she said, don't kill it. I've got to have this child live. And I've got to see him raise up, even if I can't. And we've all heard many stories about how mothers have born children into this world and immediately adopted them out because they knew that their situation wouldn't be right and they couldn't raise this child, this child the right way but so they give them up for adoption as soon as they're born and it's not an easy thing for a mother to do this but these ladies do this why because they care for that child so deeply that even they, they recognize the fact that I can't provide the life that this child needs so I'm going to give him a chance to live a better life with someone else we know a man, a great man of God, and his story is that his mother did just that. When, when he was born, he was born out of wedlock, and there was just, in the time of that he was born, that would just taboo, it didn't happen. It would have been a life of ridicule and mockery, so she gave him up for adoption immediately as soon as he was born. He lived his life with his adopted parents, and in his adulthood, he eventually found his real birth mother and was able to have a beautiful relationship with his adopted mother as well as his birth mother and that mother's heart said you know my life cannot give this child the life the care the nurture that he needs so I'm going to put him up adoption because she cared about the child more than she did herself and that is a mother's heart that puts the child first in care and nurture and says it's not comfortable for me but it's best for the child so this is the action that we're going to do now in this story with Solomon, we see that the mother of the baby that died, she was kind of lacking in the area of having a true mother's heart. Number one, she rolled onto her baby in the middle of the night and suffocated him. I know that accidents happen, but I remember when my boy was first born, David, and he made just the tiniest little whimper squeak in the middle of the night. My wife shot out of bed so fast that her blood pressure dropped and she fell on the floor. Why? Because that mother's heart was, even though she had fallen asleep, she was still listening and caring for that child and waiting for the noise. And she wasn't so deep asleep that the child could do whatever it wanted and she wasn't going to listen. And this mother fell so deep asleep, not really caring about that child, that she rolled on top of him and didn't even realize it until it was too late. And then also, she was quick to swap them out. She wasn't, I mean, if... A true mother's heart if her child dies she's gonna wake up the neighborhood wailing for her dead child but instead she just swaps him out and goes back to sleep and then she's also quick to allow the living child to be cut in two so this lady was did not have a true mother's heart within her but the the mother of the living baby did have a true mother's heart and she cared for that child and wanted to nurture it and that is a mother's heart the way that it works in a lady is that when a child is born she cares about nurturing it. she cares about letting this child become the best that it can she cares about pushing this child through life to not be satisfied with the whole home but to push themselves to achieve things to further their their academics to further the knowledge she pushes the true mother's heart nurtures and cares for this child throughout life. Now I know many people that have adult children that situations aren't right but still mother wants to take care of the child and it doesn't matter how crazy the life of the child gets mother still wants to nurture that child. I don't know if you've heard of the term tough love but that is I've seen that many times where a mother will allow the child to go through things and people say why are you doing that because I love that child and I want them to be able to get out of the mess they're in so they will give that child tough love it may not seem to be the thing to do for some but 
it is what should be done in some situations. And the mother's heart says, I know that this hurts me to watch my child be in pain, but I know it's for the best. So the nurturing of a, child, of a mother sometimes allows them to walk these roads that aren't good for them. But the mother's heart in the end is for the good of that child. Now all of this about mother's heart does not apply simply to ladies that have children. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, Paul is writing, he says, But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. What does that mean? Well, Paul, <clears throat> he was unmarried. He never married. <clears throat> and all of the husband and father heart that was within him was now poured into the church. He cared for the church. He espoused himself to the church. He cared for the the new ones coming into the church as a father does. He called himself the father in Christ to many, many men. And <clears throat> so now these, this father-husband role that he would have had if he was married was poured into the church. And that is what he's saying with the unmarried and the widows is that you still have that mother's heart within you. And even if you don't have children, you still have that mother's heart. And now let that mother's heart be poured into the church and poured into others around you. Galatians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27 says, But the Jerusalem above, and this is a section talking about the Old and the New Covenants, and this is talking about the New Testament Covenant Church. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. So Paul is telling us that even if you physically in this natural world are unmarried or barren or unable to have children, or you don't have children yet, you still have more children than a regular lady who is married and has children. Why? Because in the church, every lady plays a role as a mother to a child. Um, there's a single lady up in the Appleton area that has no children, and she kind of took a shine to my daughter Lila, and she'll have her over sometimes, and they'll do crafts and bake things and have a great, <clears throat> great time together, but it's beautiful because this lady has become a mother figure to my daughter. And why that is so important is that there will come a time when my daughter will be in a situation that she will be uncomfortable coming to mom and dad with, but this other lady is now able to be that mother figure to her. And now she'll be able to go to her and she'll be able to help her where Lila wouldn't feel comfortable with her own parents. But that is the importance of every lady in the church, that, that mother's heart, you nurture, you help, you, you care for the others in the church. When we, when we were younger, me and my wife were younger, we were in a youth group and there was a lady in the church who <clears throat> her children were both grown adults and moved away and her husband passed away from heart failure. Well, this lady, she started, you know, because the youth group would go over there to help her out. Well, then this relationship started to build between her and the youth group and she became like a, a mother to the whole youth group for lack of a better term. She'd have us over and we'd help her and she'd feed us. I mean, it was just a great thing. And she still, I mean, just the other day, she called me asking me a question about something and we had a little conversation. So these mothers, these ladies in the church that you may not have children, but you still have a special place in the church because you have that mother's heart that God can use. And just as Paul said, I'm unmarried and I'm not, I don't have children, but that father and husband heart was poured into the church. And that is as it is with the ladies who are unmarried or widows or barren in the church is that that mother's heart is still God has put it in you to use in the church and that <clears throat> excuse me and that nurturing that the care for that can be poured into others I know in our church I see that there's those who see the younger and they care for them and it's a beautiful thing when this happens because I mean it's um the I've heard it said many times that it takes a village to raise a child. And that is the truth within the church is that a mother and father can do the best they can do for a child, but sometimes it's lacking, it's not complete. And that is where the, the other ladies in the church step forward and they become these 
mother figures as well. So every mother that's out there, I admonish you because you have that mother's heart that's within you. Every, every lady has this and you use it for the kingdom and you use it for your own children and it is a beautiful thing. <clears throat> now I've been talking about physical mothers so far. But now I want to transition to talking about the church as the mother. And throughout the Bible, the church is called the bride of Christ. All of us, the church, the, the apostolic one God, Holy Ghost filled church, we are all called the bride of Christ. And the church is also throughout scripture referred to as the mother, as we read before in Jer the New Jerusalem that's talking about this heavenly kingdom, the mother of us all. This, the church is the mother. <clears throat> in the writings of the Apostle John, in uh, First and Second John, he frequently refers to little children, and he's talking about the babes in Christ, the young in Christ, those who are coming in and who are newly born again, who have just experienced a new birth. And as the bride of Christ, the church is to have the heart of a mother. Just as a lady that gets married desires these children, that mother's heart within her desires these children, so should it be with the church. 1 Samuel 1 and 8 again, it's talking about Elkanah says to his wife, Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? The church should have this cry, this heart cry that says, yes, I'm in relationship with God and it's a beautiful thing. And, but we should have this burning desire within us, the mother's heart within us that says, my relationship with, with God is necessary and it fulfills that God-shaped hole that's within me. But there's another part of me that cannot be fulfilled and that is the desire for babies, the desire for children. And don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? No, I'm, I'm not satisfied with just relationship, but I'm satisfied when I have that relationship and I have babies to work with, babies coming in. The, ch the church has got to have the heart of a mother that is only satisfied when we have that strong relationship with him and babies coming in. And with, as with mothers, and when my children were, were born, the mother is holding the child more than any other human on earth. The mother is feeding the child. The mother is caring for the child as the father does his business. But my wife made it a very, uh, she made a point to make sure that there was times where I would hold those children. She would give that child to me and say, you need to have that bonding time. Why? Because the mother knew that it wasn't healthy if the child did not have that relationship with the father. And that is the way it is with the church. When... Yes, we win people to God and they come into the church and a lot of times people are one, two people. But it is then the mother's job to turn the child to the father and also create that father relationship with the child. And it's... And the, the church has got to have this heart that says, I want these babies. I'm not going to be satisfied without these babies. As with Hannah, the church should be weeping and fasting, desiring... I don't, want, I don't feel like eating today because I need a Bible study. I don't feel like eating today because there's lost souls that need to be born again, babies that need to be brought into the church. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, the Apostle Paul writing again, he says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. So he's saying that, as a woman goes through the travail and the pains of labor, he's having those type of travail and the pains and the agony of prayer and deep moaning and groaning before God to have Christ formed in you in these babies that are being born into Christ. And that is the role of the church as the mother is to bring these babies about. And me and my wife, we after we had David, we had a couple miscarriages in between, and it was a hard time getting pregnant with Lila. And what did we do? We went to the doctor and found out what was wrong. There was something that was wrong in her body that needed to be righted before we could have another child, Lila. And the church, we did, we've got to examine ourselves and say, is there something wrong? Is, 
are we miscarrying? Is pe are people not coming to Christ? Are pe is there a problem having these babies? The church needs to examine and say, I've got to have children. I've got to have these babies be born. And there should be weeping and fasting for to that end that says, God, search us and change us and make us a healthy mother so that we can have these babies and babies can be born. And of course, once the baby is born, then the mother's heart turns to the care and the nurturing of that child, to care for it, as I said, to turn the child as well to the father and make sure it's not just the baby and the mother, but it's also the baby and the father. And yes, as with physical children, there's going to be times when things aren't done right. And, you know, our, our children in this earth, they can sometimes slap us in the face, so to, speak, so to speak, where we give them everything and then they turn on us. And that can happen as well when babies are born into the church. But it is, it is always the mother's job to care for and nurture that child and to bring that child to the place where they become all that they can be and to push them and to say, you're not don't be satisfied with the whole home. Don't be satisfied with small achievements. But the heart of the mother pushes the, the, the child to, to, to nurture it, to care for it, to, to raise it up, to be what it should be when it grows older. Amen. Well, today I just pray that each and every mother that is listening is encouraged to know that you have this mother's heart within you that it's useful in your children if you don't have children there's other babies in the church there's other people in the church that that mother's heart can reach out to and help and also the church has got to be the mother the bride of christ the mother that is desiring and yearning for these babies that is the mother's heart should be within us to, to care for these babies and to nurture them to 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 travail ourselves until Christ is formed in them. Amen. Well, I love each and every one of you. I deeply honor every mother, every lady that mothers people around them. I honor you and thank you for all that you do. And I just pray that we take a moment now to just pray and internalize this, that we're honoring our mothers, but we're also, God, make, give the church, give us as the church, the mother's heart within us that yearns for these babies and also yearns to nurture and care for these babies. Amen. God bless. I love each and every one of you. And we're going to enter in a time of prayer right now. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We're so thankful, God, that, Lord, on this day, we're celebrating our mothers, Lord, that have nurtured us and cared for us, Lord, that have brought us into this world, Lord, and carried us in times when, when we are, Lord, when we did things we shouldn't do and slapped our mothers in the face, so to speak, God, and turned against them. But God, we thank you that those mothers have carried and nurtured us. And I pray, Lord, today that you would give this church, oh God, the mother's heart, Lord, that desires after those babies to be born, Lord, that nurtures and cares for the babies. Oh God, I pray, give us a mother's heart, Lord, that is not satisfied with only relationship with you, God. Yes, the relationship with you is so vital, is so important, God, but I pray that there would be something within us that is not satisfied with anything but having these babies be born, then seeing souls saved, God, give us a mother's heart, I pray, Jesus. Let that yearning, that desire be within us that drives us to fasting and weeping oh god i pray that drives us to travail for these babies oh lord i pray jesus that we would have a love lord a mother's love for every baby lord that would overlook the the wrongs that would overlook the the burp ups and the, the things that that we don't like lord that would overlook these things because the love of the baby i pray jesus that you would give us oh god the mother's heart jesus hallelujah lord we love you and worship you today God, I pray that you would bless each and every saint today of Tabernacle of Praise as we go forth. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us, God. We're in a time that we don't like, God. That's, everything is upside down with this pandemic. But God, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts, God. Encourage our hearts with your spirit, Lord. Pray in Jesus' name that you go forth with every one of us today, God. I pray that you bless every mother today, that there would still be celebration, however it could be, Lord, of of each mother we pray in jesus name today we love you lord amen well god bless you all we love you and we're gonna play another